Hello, hello. I am ready to talk about the Augustan age. The Augustan age is the early 18th century. And it is called Augustan because it was as brilliant as the age of Augustus Caesar in Rome. Remember in the period of Roman classicism? This was an age in England, 18th century, an age of stability, neoclassicism, moderation, decorum, a brilliant age, an age of order and discipline. The period of Queen Anne had started in 1702. Remember, I had already told you Queen Anne is the last of the Stuarts. Oh, poor Queen Anne. She was pregnant all the time. She didn't have children. Her pregnancies didn't work out well. And she was bedridden. So, this was a period in which the ministers gained power. And this was also a period of great transformations in English society. Remember, the formation of Great Britain happened at this time. England and Scotland were two kingdoms in the Stuart period. The Stuarts were from Scotland. They were also ruling England. England and Scotland. England is in the south. Scotland is in the north. They became one kingdom called Great Britain. That is the Act of Union of 1707. Three years later, in 1710, what happened? The first Copyright Act, also called the Statute of Anne. The first Copyright Act had a lot of implications on writing. People's originality, writer's self-expression began to be acknowledged as valuable. This led to less plagiarism. Slowly, slowly, hack writers were controlled. Not immediately, but slowly. The period of Queen Anne was also the time when restoration comedy and its immoralities were flourish, still flourishing. And slowly, that also came to an end. In the period after the Stuart dynasty or the Queen Anne's reign, there was the Hanoverian succession. During that time, there was the licensing order, licensing act. The Hanoverian succession took place in 1714. The Whigs and Tories were always fighting over various things. They fought over the Hanoverian succession also. The Whigs wanted them to come to power. The Tories resisted. And they kept fluctuating. The Hanoverian monarchs are George the First, George the Second, George the Third, George the Fourth. Now you are starting to say five, six, seven, wait, 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 only four Georges. George one, two, three, four. And then William the Fourth. And then Hanoverian succession ended with the succession of Queen Victoria in 1837. Hanoverian succession, 1714 to 1837. Clear everybody? So no, whatever I am saying, important points, take down, okay? Right, just reminding you. So, this was a time of moderation and tolerance, as I told you at the beginning. The Hanoverians did not allow excesses. They wanted control. They wanted moderation. They wanted stability. Classical values came to the fore at this time. The Hanoverian kings established classical values through their political choices. And the neoclassical writers came into being. As you already know, Ben Johnson of the Jacobian period was the first neoclassical writer. Hannah, the greatest neoclassical writer. Dryden came in the Restoration period. Now, in the Augustan period, we have a lot of neoclassicists like Alexander Pope, Jonathan Swift, later Dr. Johnson. Hey, hey, all these writers were actually inspired by a lot of French writers. 
you know french influence was there in the restoration period itself in the augustan age they were inspired by continental writers and uh, this led to a lot of debate also in jonathan swift's battle of books the debate which is important ancients or moderns that is continued from france this was a time when writing became a business the commerce of writing people began to make money by writing <laughs> this also led to hack writers grub street hacks lots of fake writers emerged at this time our scribblers club remember alexander pope's uh, jonathan swift etc they attacked fake writers in dunciad for example that reminds me this was a time of clubs and coffee houses there was a formation of what we call now as public sphere do you know which theorist talked about public sphere i'll wait write in the comments box which theorist talked about public sphere bolo bolo ha it is jurgen habermas habermas talked about public sphere public sphere means what a space where people get together they share their opinions they even influence political decisions in the 18th century public sphere emerged in the clubs and coffee houses and today public sphere is what our social media at the time india got independent and in the first couple of decades i suppose even now in villages there are local tea shops where people especially men will go and sit and probably read newspapers discuss local news everything from national news to local news they will discuss those local tea shops were also an example of public sphere so this is a very important uh, concept that emerged in the 18th century clubs and coffee houses we have to talk about them in detail but before i talk about them let me tell you another thing the 18th century was the time of agricultural revolution this is england okay this is england here and there there are lots of small small farms small small farmers in the 18th century many of these farms got collected and enclosed by rich land lords this is called enclosure farming why because agricultural equipment was invented you know things like tractors agricultural uh machinery was invented for which small small tracts of land are not enough you need big areas to cultivate with machinery right so enclosure farming what did it lead to lots of poor people had to leave that area they went and settled in other places and these other places came to be called towns so 18th century witnessed the formation of lots of new towns small towns grew into cities agricultural revolution it is called and when small towns turned into cities what happened what happened is in and around these cities or towns industries developed why because cheap labor is available here did you get me so agricultural revolution led to industrial revolution in the 18th century wait before i talk about clubs and coffee houses one more thing i have to tell you in the augustan period there was a flowering once again of art and science and literature so many things happened new genres new writers new meters poetic diction heroic couplet so this was all related did you know that do you understand the developments in culture and literature are related to developments in science they are related to developments in religion let me explain in religion 
there are two beliefs theism and deism theism is the belief that god is with us here he's taking care of us in hinduism we can say that is the concept of vishnu vishnu is the protector he takes care of us he's here like krishna hai na in christianity also theism is there god is with us there's another belief deism deism is the idea that god is not here with us god is like the clockmaker he has made this universe or world and the world is ticking by itself it is running by itself god is not here taking care of the world got me guys that is deism so there is no way you can know about god directly you can't see god you have to know about god through the creations of god getting me you have to know about god through nature look at the plants the trees the mountains look at human life look at society these are all ways of knowing god and this belief in deism led to science how physics is the study of the physical forces of nature biology is a study of plants and anim animals chemistry is a study of chemicals <laughs> of nature so what me what it means is study nature study life around you that is knowing god science modern science developed in the 18th century as a means of knowing god what does that mean science is engaged in knowing nature literature is engaged in knowing hard working people's lives all these are various ways of knowing god this is why in the augustan period periodical started where everyday life was documented this is why novels came into being because people wanted to know about other people's lives public sphere and mass media are related see and all this is related to science religion philosophy and the 18th century did you like the story of the 18th century now amazing and science was already being promoted by the royal society that came into being after the restoration hai na so with that introduction let me come to the various clubs and coffee houses first and foremost the kit kat club many members of the kit kat club they they were predominantly wigs they got together and they were all being fed by by one cook called christopher who used to make meat pies that is why the club came to be called kit kat club the important members were wigs robert walpole the prime minister during the hanoverian period he was an important member of the kit kat club william congreve the writer of restoration comedies another writer of restoration comedies was van brer shh listen to me this congreve and van brer were both attacked by jeremy collier probably because jeremy collier did not like the kit kat club jeremy collier did not like the liberal attitudes of the kit kat club i suppose congreve and van brer were both members of the kit kat club attacked by congreve now the member of the kit kat club another wig you know him very well he was attacked by pope as atticus that is joseph addison the periodical essayist joseph addison as well as his friend richard steel members of the kit kat club now the member of the kit kat club was jacob tonson we will know about him more in the next video when we talk about alexander pope jacob tonson was the man who published pope's pastorals early poem remember will you remember 
So that is a Kit Kat club. Did you like them? Now, there are a group of Tories who formed the Scribbleras Club. Listen to me, guys. Alexander Pope was first friends with the Whigs. Then he left their company, moved on to join the Tories in Scribbleras Club. Alexander Pope and Jonathan Swift were very important members. Their friend John Gay. John Gay wrote Beggar's Opera because of the influence of Swift. Another member of the Scribblerus Club was John Arbuthnot. Are the same John Arbuthnot, who is the physician of Pope. And Pope wrote about him epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot. Dr. John Arbuthnot, who created the character John Bull representing England. Another predominant member of the Scribblerus Club was Thomas Parnell. You know him. And we are going to talk about him later in the Transitional Poets. Thomas Parnell was an important graveyard poet. Night peas on death. Remember, that is what he wrote. Hope you'll remember. So, the Scribblerus Club had some aims. They wanted to attack false learning. They attacked the moderns. The Scribblerus Club their aims were called scriblerianism, which is documented in important works like Gulliver's Travels, The Dunciad, etc. So, these are two predominant groups or clubs. There are lots more. Do you know the blue stocking women? There were a group of women who got together, met discussed important issues some men also were influenced by them i don't know if you have heard their names they are very important elizabeth carter elizabeth montague hester chapon hannah moore mary delany have you heard of them these are all women we never heard of them before probably because they did not write a distinctly, distinctly blue stocking work. But our Samuel Richardson was influenced by them. And then we have Samuel Richardson's own circle. Samuel Richardson's circle included women writers. Samuel Richardson had a great insight into women's character in novels like Pamela and Clarissa because of his friendship with these women. Henry Fielding's sister, Sarah Fielding. Sheridan's mother, Frances Sheridan. And Charlotte Lennox, the author of Female Quixote. These are important figures of Samuel Richardson's circle. And then there is Dr. Johnson's circle. At first, there were nine members. The Group grew, grew, grew into 30 members. 35 in fact. I will introduce all of them to you. They are all here. Joshua Reynolds was a portraitist. Joshua Reynolds was the chairman of the Royal Academy of Arts. He followed a classical style. Please Google search. You will find a lot of portraits that he has made. Joshua Reynolds, a very prominent member of Dr. Johnson's circle. And then there was Oliver Goldsmith. Oliver Goldsmith, everybody knows, is a writer, playwright, novelist. Dr. Johnson helped him to publish his Vicar of Wakefield. Then there is David Garrick. He was an actor and Dr. Johnson's student. He was a major Shakespearean actor of Drury Lane Theatre. Then there was our Richard Brinsley Sheridan. Always Goldsmith and Sheridan are remembered together. They wrote anti-sentimental comedies at the end of the 18th century. Then there was Adam Smith, the father of economics. Adam Smith advocated laissez-faire economics 
in his seminal book, The Wealth of Nations. Adam Smith was very instrumental in ushering in a new age of commerce, capitalism. And another member was Edmund Burke, the philosopher. Edmund Burke was a conservative philosopher. And he has talked about sublimity. He attacked the French Revolution. Very important figure. In Indian history also, we talk about Edmund Burke. Then James Boswell. James Boswell, as a, you might know, was a biographer. He was the biographer of J, uh, Johnson himself. The life of Dr. Johnson is written by James Boswell. So these are the important members of Johnson's circle. Each one of them is illustrious. All of them were torchbearers of Augustan age and neoclassicism. At this time, neoclassicism flourished. Neoclassicism gave importance to wit and nature. What nature? Human nature. It was Alexander Pope who said, follow nature means follow human nature. And wit and nature were both upheld by Pope in his 1711 book, Essay on Criticism. Neoclassicism gave importance to nature. It gave importance to decorum or appropriateness. It gave importance to universal values over individual values. It gave importance to order, symmetry, rules. And neoclassicism is poetry of urbanity, of aristocracy and the middle class both living in towns not in villages mostly neoclassicism is closely related to the movement called enlightenment enlightenment was a philosophical movement that gave importance to reason progress science enlightenment emerged in france and germany in Germany, there were important Enlightenment philosophers, Immanuel Kant, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. You must have heard these names in the context of literary theory. In France, there were people like Diderot, Montesquieu, Voltaire and Rousseau. Diderot and his friends undertook the project of rewriting knowledge in an objective manner, in a secular manner. Knowledge, dear friends, until then was the prerogative of the church. Knowledge was religious. There was a religious coloring to science in its early phase. But science liberated itself from religion, became objective because of the efforts of writers like Diderot also. Diderot wrote encyclopedia, 100 volumes were there. Much of it was written in hiding. And the encyclopedia codified knowledge in a totally new way, objective and scientific. Remember, this was the time of great scientists like Isaac Newton. And science became a very prominent power that propelled the society in the coming ages. So neoclassicism went hand in hand with enlightenment and this led to a new age of knowledge. Deism and science were also related, remember? It reflected in the periodicals and in the novels that emerged at this time. In literature at this time, there was the age of sensibility. Age of sensibility means the importance given to noble causes, the importance given to liberation of people, spreading tolerance. You know, in American literature, Harriet Beecher Stowe's 
Uncle Tom's Cabin is an important book within this age of sensibility. Literature of sensibility was written by writers like Samuel Richardson. His Pamela belongs to this genre. Later, sensibility was critiqued by writers like Jane Austen in Sense and Sensibility. In Augustan poetry at this time, two important terms were there, concepts were there. Can you tell me in the chat box? What are the two deciding terms or features of Augustan poetry? You are writing neoclassicism, that is correct. Well, what I meant is poetic diction. Alexander Pope advocated the use of poetic diction and also the use of heroic couplet. These two were deciding factors of Augustan poetry, which was predominantly poetry of the town. What are the major genres in Augustan poetry? The pastoral, the mock epic and the satire. Remember, this was a time when poetry was not about self-expression. Poetry was not about emotions. Poetry was written about so many everyday aspects like gardening, cooking, sheep farming, etc. But not about people's emotions. Poetry, neoclassical poetry, held itself to be above other genres. And neoclassical prose was replete with reason. It was Matthew Arnold who called the Augustan age the age of prose and reason. During this time there was a rise of periodicals. The daily current was the first daily periodical. There were so many other periodicals like Tatler 1709 to 1711. Spectator started in 1712. And it was revived in 1714. Daniel Defoe edited the periodical The Review. Dr. Johnson was associated with many periodicals like The Rambler and Gentleman's Magazine, The Idler, The Adventurer. Jonathan Swift was the editor of The Entertainer. So this was the age of periodicals and periodical essays. And periodical essays eventually gave rise to the novel. The most important feature of 18th century novel was realism. Daniel Defoe wrote external realism. Samuel Richardson wrote realism of the mind. Delving into character. And Henry Fielding perfected the form of realism. Lawrence Stern critiqued realism. At this time, two predominant modes of novel writing were the epistolary novel, monopolized by Samuel Richardson, and also the picaresque novel, monopolized by Tobias Smollett. It was the 19th century historian George Sainsbury who talked about the four wheels of the English novel. Listen to me, friends. If the English novel is a carriage. It has four wheels. And they are Richardson, Fielding, Smollett and Stern. Four wheels of the English novel. So in the coming videos, I will be talking in depth about these writers and their works. As I always remind you, read extra, research, enjoy. And wait for the next video tomorrow and every day at 6 p.m. Bye-bye until the next video.